there and welcome once again to our Bible studies here, our program In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of everybody in the Bible Talk team and Mark and Alice and myself, I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in our study of how Christianity has been influenced by the world and world systems and how we can get back to where it's supposed to be. But before we do that, and pick up from where we left off last week, Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our yes, time together. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I, we know you're here, but Lord, just guide us in what we say and what we present. Let it be your word and let there be new insight so we can live a life that you want us to. Amen. Amen to that. Amen. Well, just to give you a really quick recap, right now, for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Babylon and how the, the religion of Babylon has influenced the Christianity of today. That ancient religion of Babylon has influenced Christianity today. Mm. And we've been looking at the theology of uh, Babylon. We started that a couple of weeks ago. And we were talking about basically it's four things. Salvation by works, the centricity of the building, the authority of the doorkeepers, and misdirected worship. And as we ended in the program last week, we were talking about the authority of the doorkeepers. Yes. The authority that they shouldn't have, by the way, right? So we're going to pick that up. And uh, I, I want to make the statement right off the bat that there's a priesthood in all of the empires of the world. Every, every major empire, every religion has had its priesthood, okay? Even in secular humanism. Hmm. Do you recognize the priesthood? Well, it's generally bureaucrats. <laughs> right, right. But somebody controls access. In the case of religion, it's somebody controls access to God or to heaven, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I say, you know, I'm not, and it's only facetious a little bit for me to say that in secular humanism, the bureaucrats, at least in the United States of America and many other countries, they become the priesthood because they control access to the benefits of the government. Right or the what what the government offers. issues or offers to people. There's a priesthood in Christianity, but the priesthood in Christianity is under one high priest, Amen. Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews three one that therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Consider Jesus. He's the high priest. Mm -hmm. Then, consider the promise that was made through the word of God, through the prophet Isaiah, 750 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, when God spoke to him and said, But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat of the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you will boast. Isaiah 61.6. And it's notable that... Isaiah 61 is where Jesus started his public ministry by taking the scroll in the synagogue and reading from the first right. verses, okay? Yes, yes. But there is the promise, because remember, there was a Levitical priesthood at that time. Mm -hmm. But the prophecy through Isaiah speaking to all of God's people was, you'll be called the priests of the Lord. Royal priesthood. Right. Well, now that, that's exactly right, because that promise was fulfilled after the day of Pentecost, after the, after the crucifixion, after the burial, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. when Peter wrote, but before I say what Peter wrote, let me tell you that he was speaking to everybody who had the same kind of faith that he had. That's what it says in the very first verse of this book, First Peter. Peter kind of faith. Right. And he said, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. So that's speaking to all true believers. We have become a royal priesthood. Amen. And because Jesus is the high priest, 
we have the boldness, we have the confidence that we can go before the throne of grace. That's been opened up to us. No human being needs to stand between us and God. It says that there is one intercessor. Paul wrote to Timothy and said there's one intercessor between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is the only one that stands between us and God the Father. Amen. Okay, that's that is so terribly important to true Christianity. All right. I was just thinking about the priesthood, the royal priesthood, but it's going to be a humble royal priesthood. Well, we have to get into that because absolutely, our relationship with God is based on humility. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, in the in the natural, mankind loves loves himself. It's pride. Of course, yeah. Right. And pride wants to raise you up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You want to exalt yourself. Yeah. But whether you're saved or not saved, listen to this. The Lord God spoke through Paul and said, Every knee shall bow, Amen. and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee shall bow. Everybody will have to call. At the, at the end of the day, everybody will call Jesus Lord. Yes. Unfortunately, not everybody will be able to call him Savior. Mm. That's, a, that's a choice you have to make today. That's the opportunity and, we have. Is and calling him Lord is a choice that you should make today. Amen. All right? Amen. Now, you know, I just want to mention, because we not long ago here did a, uh, a multi-part study mm -hmm. on the letters to the churches in the, in the book of Revelation. Right. And twice, Jesus mentions, as he's speaking to the churches, the Nicolaitans. Mm -hmm. in, the church, in the church of Ephesus, he commends them because... Like Jesus, they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Right. In Pergamum, on the other hand, it seems that they're tolerating the Nicolaitans. Mm -hmm. And while there's, there's some debate about what that is, either were they followers of Nicholas, um, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and but the etymology of the word, where the word comes from, the Greek words, mm -hmm. uh, and Nicolaitans means conquerors of the laity. Mm -hmm. So it was a class that rose above the average people. A priestly class, a spiritual elite, so mm -hmm. to speak, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me make this comment about spiritual elite. Wait a second, mm -hmm. go, go back to that word. Is that a derogatory term? Nick what? Mm -hmm. Nicolaitans. Conqueror of laity. Yeah, I would say that, yeah. of course it. I mean, think Jesus says that he hates the deeds of Nicolaitans. So, How, call, that's pretty derogatory. so calling yourself a Nicolaitan is a derogatory term on the other people in a group. Well, they wouldn't call themselves that. They would call themselves priests. Right. They would call themselves, you know, the leaders. They, they would call themselves, in some way, shape or form, they would exalt themselves as, as the elite, the special people in the church. All right? So, and, you know, you wouldn't want to call yourself that because it's, no, it is a derogatory right, term. Right, right. And when Jesus uses the term, it's not complimentary. I, trust me on that. But I wanted to, to recount something when it talks about, you know, I'm talking about the spiritual elite and everything. Right. Uh, and, and I've shared this before in other Bible studies, I think. Years ago, um, I was in my apartment, um, and I just wanted to hear. I was praying about something, and I truly needed to hear from the Lord. I, I was desperate to hear from the Lord that day. And I picked up my Bible and I was reading the Bible and I, I just wasn't, I wasn't connecting, so to speak. And I went in to use the bathroom, quite frankly. And as I was sitting there, there was a little, we had a little table next to, next to the, the loo for my British friends. And on it, Alice had her Bible. Mm -hmm. And I thought, good. So I picked up her Bible and I opened it up. And I got to tell you something. Well, it was one of my Bibles. One of her Bibles. The print, you would have need a super yeah. magnifying glass to read this print. I surely couldn't. I, so I was so disappointed because I picked up the Bible, and I literally couldn't read it just because of the, the size of the print. So I was really disappointed, as I said. But sitting next to the Bible on that, on that little table, Alice had a large print a crossword puzzle book. So I picked up the crossword puzzle, puzzle book. Because I could read that. And I flipped it open, and I'm thinking, Lord, speak to me. And I looked down, and there it was. 36 across. And what it says, the clue in the crossword was, 
church bigwigs. And I thought to myself, church bigwigs? So I went to the back of the book and I looked up the answer. And the answer was elders. And then I heard the voice of God. And he said to me, I'm the only bigwig in the church. That's right. <laughs> he is the head. Nobody else can take credit for anything in the body of Christ. It says, if any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. We have to come to that place. So this is one of the problems with, with the, the concept of priesthood in the world in other religions, is they are the ones who are exalted. They are the ones who are special. And Jesus Christ is the only one that should be elevated. Absolutely. Now that doesn't mean, I mean, because God will use, ex he'll use some people mm -hmm. in ways that he doesn't use others. Right. That's his choice. But that doesn't mean that it demeans the other person. No, we talked about this in one of our previous shows. Every Program. Christian. Hmm? Program. Program. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. This is, this is not entertainment. No. Although, the Word of God should bring you joy. Okay, but that's another story. But one of the things we talked about is, we're talking about every Christian, true Christian, who has the same kind of faith as Peter, is a priest to God. That's right. Yes. But every Christian has a ministry. Amen. It says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, I'm going to say chapter 12, that the Spirit of God works through each one as he wills. Every Christian has a ministry. Now, you know, some may be more apparent, some may be more public, some may be more visible within the body of Christ, but every Christian has a ministry, mm -hmm. all right? But in every ministry, God, Jesus Christ, is still the head. There's always been a problem with people that exalt themselves spiritually, particularly in the quote-unquote, I'm putting quotes around this, the church leadership. Go back one way. Go back to the time of the Old Testament, Ezekiel. All right? I'm going to read to you from Ezekiel 34, verses 2, 3, and 4. All right? Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sick you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up the scattered, you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost, but with force and with severity you have dominated them. That has always been the telling clue that that, that false priesthood, that false ministry dominates people. It exalts itself at the expense of other people. What was the ministry of Peter? Feed, feed my, my sheep. Absolutely, feed my sheep. Now, this part of this goes to the fact that too many people are running around. Alice and I have been doing missionary work for, for basically 40 years, right? I started on the streets in New York City where I grew up, going on the street and ministering to runaways, drug addicts, pimps and prostitutes. Cults. Cults. A lot of work with cults, yeah. And God used me back then in the, in the mid-70s to start a congregation in the suburbs of New York City. But you know what? It wasn't my church. No. And here's what the word says. One plants, another waters, but it's God who gives the growth. Jesus said that he would build his church. Mm -hmm. But as in the time of Ezekiel and before, all too many, quote, 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 church leaders are building their own kingdoms. It is because many have not been called by God. That's a, that's the truth. Not everybody that's standing behind a pulpit or you know wearing rope. Not not everybody has been called by God. No. Others who have been called have forgotten why God called and equipped them, right. just like Solomon did. Yes. Right now, this is really important. And I, I pray, if you don't read this along with me, please go spend time during the week and look at this. You see, the Lord gave Solomon a gift. 
right? Yes. Solomon asked for wisdom to lead, to judge properly the people of God, to serve the people of God. The Lord was so blessed with that, he said, I'll give you that, and I'm also going to give you more, all right? But in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and that's the chapter I want you to spend a little time in this coming week. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15, Solomon says, Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. He said, why have I become wise? Why have I been wise? He forgot why God gave him the wisdom. He forgot that God gave him the wisdom, that he had asked for wisdom to serve God's people. But if you look in verse in chapter 2, and I'm just going to read you from a few verses. In verse 4, Solomon says, I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. In verse 5, he said, I made gardens and parks for myself. In verse 6, he said, I made ponds of water for myself. In verse 7, he said, I bought male and female slaves. I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me. In verse 8, he said, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings. There's more to that chapter. Read it. But can you get the point? Myself, 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 myself. He had stopped building the kingdom of God and started building his own kingdom. And so many leaders today, pastors particularly, are disappointed and disillusioned and burning out. I mean, the number of how many pastors here in the United States leave the ministry every month is staggering. You know why? Because of this. Here's what happened in Solomon, all right? In verse 17 and 18 of that second chapter of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun. Here is a man, known for his wisdom to this day, yes. known for his riches forever, and yet he hated his life. How come? How did he get so disappointed? How did he get so disillusioned? How did he get so burned out? Because he had turned from doing God's kingdom to doing his own. That's a danger not only to pastors. That's not only a danger to people, quote unquote, building congregations. It's a danger to anybody. If you are out there doing things for yourself, rather than doing things as unto the Lord and for the Lord, don't be surprised if you get burned out. Don't, get, don't be surprised if all of a sudden you can't stand what you're doing. I have a heart for pastors. Listen, I've, I've been a pastor. I teach pastors all the time. I have seen so many pastors who have burned out. Why? One of the reasons is because of the peer pressure on them to succeed. Don't you think you said before that the the um, they're not called, so they're they're what would you would call hirelings? Yeah, yeah, that's that's and that's a that's evil. That's a shame. All yes. right, so but they to see definitely would get burned out. Yeah, but to see pastors who have responded who to the call of God, yes, and forgotten why God has called them and become disillusioned and burnout, out, that's, that is pitifully sad. Yes, yes. Why does it happen? Like I said, I have seen this happen over and over and over because they have this peer pressure to succeed, but succeed based on the world's standards. Because they start listening to the world, listening to... Well, you know, I thought about this when I was praying. Others. And you may not like the way I put this, but I'm going to tell you the measure of success by world standards in the church. Three things. Butts, bucks, and buildings. <laughs> The three B's. I was going to do the two. Well, I did the three. Okay, butts, bucks, and buildings. Hmm. Pastors are judged on how large their congregation is, how big their budget is, and how grand their building is. That's the measure of success. Yes. When the only true measure of success is on the day that they come into the presence of God, they hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We are to show ourselves approved unto God. And ever so often, when you show yourself approved unto God, 
men will not approve of what you're doing. Men inside the church and outside the church. That's a fact. That's right. Now, I, I, wanna, I just want to make something clear. I'm not saying any of this at all for condemnation. Of course not. I, I say this for encouragement. Encouragement to remember and repent. If you're out there, and I don't care if it's in a, in a church setting, a ministry, or in your job at work. If you're getting burned out, if you're getting to that place where it's a dread for you to show up, you're doing it wrong. Yes. You know, I in one of the seminars I do, I do, you know, for years, then seminars on biblical principles in the workplace. And I've, I've always said that if you're not having fun doing what you're doing, you're either doing the wrong thing, or you're doing the thing wrong. Amen. And 99% of the time it's because you're doing the thing wrong. Okay? Start to give thanks. Start to focus on pleasing God. Not, to, not pleasing men. Now you know what? In a secular setting, that may cost you your job. You can't get fired if you're working for the Lord. You can only get transferred. Amen. That's the truth. If you don't believe me, go ask Him. You know, this program is designed to be me reaching out to the bond servants of Jesus Christ. You should understand this. And if you don't, or you disagree with me, and I've always said, I'm happy that you write to me and, and tell me what you think is different from what I'm saying. But do me a favor and make sure that you're giving scriptural evidence, not just how you feel, not just your opinion. Okay? That's part of the problem in the church. Let me just interject this about them forgetting they could also be distracted because one of the things well, the schemes of the yeah. devil is the distraction but that's one of the reasons that you that you get to that place where you're burned out is because you're be, because you know, one of the reasons you forget is because you're you're, not focused. you're distracted yeah. you're not focused on it all right and if you're not if you're not focused on it you'll be all of a sudden your priorities will start to change yes. I, I i just want to tell another little story here. I had been used of God to start a congregation not far from here, just uh, maybe an hour north of here in Orlando back in the uh, early 80s. And God was blessing that. It was, a, I, it was a, a wonderful church family and a lot of good things were happening. A lot of wonderful things were happening. But we, one of the things, in addition to the couple of Bible studies we did, and we used to do two and three hour Bible studies during the, the weekly evenings. Uh, we had a music ministry and we practiced and, and I did a course of Sunday services. Mm -hmm. A lot of fellowship. A lot of, together, a lot of fellowship with people in the congregation. Mm -hmm. And we then started, the families, we all got together and we started a Christian school, mm -hmm. which was very time consuming. And uh, I, I had an office in this building that God had provided for us. And I can remember one day sitting there and thinking, I'm spending more time on business than on Bible. Yeah. And I, because I felt like I was getting distracted mm -hmm. from, from the work that the Lord had called me to. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there at my desk and I was praying, you know, because I know the answer. You know what the answer is? It's always to get back to the cross. Amen. Amen. It's not without reason that Paul said that he had determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. So I was sitting there at my desk and I'm kind of looking out the window and I said, Lord, I just want to see the cross more clearly. I want to see the cross more clearly. And there was a knock at the door. And there were some fellows there. And they had a ministry from a, a fellow. This is, some of you may have been aware of this back in the 80s. They went around and found places where they could plant three wooden crosses. You may see them in front of churches in different places around the country still. So they asked me if they could put crosses up on the front of our property. And I said, of course you can. Mm -hmm. So they went out and they went through this process. I mean, these are good-sized crosses. Yes, and they, they you know, they go through all of this work and everything, and they put it up. And I looked right out my window, and right outside my window, there is the center cross. Right. <laughs> and I got, so, I got so tickled in my spirit. I had been praying, Lord, show me the cross more clearly. Well, that's not necessarily the cross I meant, but it was the one that drew my heart, my eyes, right, right and my spirit back to that cross that brought salvation in, 
into my life. Hallelujah. You know, I remember that because you came down to the school and had everybody stop and come a- absolutely, together yeah. so you could share it with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't, get don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. God will make it a way, make a way for you, not to get distracted. So you can, because the Word of God says in Hebrews twelve, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and first yes. finisher or perfecter of your faith. Yes. So uh, let me get back to this concept of leadership in the church. Mm-hmm. I'm. Uh, there are leadership schools. Mm-hmm. There are leadership conferences. There are leadership magazines. Mm-hmm. Everywhere you go, there in the church, there's all this leadership stuff. You want to be a leader. Would you like to be a leader in the church? Pick up a broom and sweep. Go ask a brother or sister in need if you can help. Bring a word of encouragement to somebody who's down. Share the word with a store clerk. Go to work and joyfully do your job as unto the Lord. You want to be a leader in the church? You do not need an advanced degree You do not need to be ordained. What you need is a heart after God, a heart to serve. Jesus said, do not be called leaders, for one is your leader. That is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And later, you know, that was Matthew 23, right? Verses 10 to 12. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, he called the apostles to himself. Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way with you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is going to return for his bond servants, yes. not for proud leaders. That can be found in the end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Mark 7, 22 to 23. I'm sorry, Matthew. The end of the Sermon on the Mount. The church needs leaders. We are the priesthood. But remember what God spoke to the prophet Hosea. He said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being my priest since you have forgotten the law of your God. We need to get into the word because Jesus is a word. And Father, I just pray that we would fulfill that office of priesthood that you have called us to, that you have ordained us in, Lord God. And that we would minister to you first and foremost. And Lord, that we would be faithful to be used by you to touch others for what you said, for what we do to the least of your brothers, we have done unto you. I praise you and thank you that you can use us for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, to me, this this half hour goes so, so quickly. Um, I, I ask you to come back and be with us next week. Tell other people to be back here, all right? Visit us on Facebook and be part of this program. God bless you and goodbye till next time. Bye bye. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love. That old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners.